So it, it, as it decays, it emits radiation. So it's like, it starts off as uranium, I think. Uh huh. And then as it decays, it turns into polonium. And actually, polonium is all over the place. It's just in super low levels. But I'm assuming it had no detectable taste. Right. I think so. it was like a powder or something. The thing is, is, man, I wish I had written this down. But it's like one gram can kill 50 million people. Oh, my God. Yeah. So it's not a heavy enough amount to notice any taste or anything. Wow. Okay. Now we're going to talk about Boris Berezovsky. Okay. I've mentioned him a couple of times before. He was a Russian oligarch who's just a rich business guy uh -huh. who also has political influence. What does oligarch mean? So that's exactly what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> Sorry <about> <laughs> They're rich business people uh -huh. that have political influence. Oh, okay. That's it. I don't know why I thought it had something to do with a religion. Yeah, no, not at all. Okay. Well, he helped fund a presidential party for Putin, but he ended up resigning and changing sides and becoming a huge critic of Putin. Okay. He said that he didn't want to be a part of the country's ruin and the restoration of an authoritarian regime. And there were other things that he didn't agree with, too. So after this, he runs to Britain, gets political asylum there, where there's an alleged assassination attempt in 2003. That's the one that Alexander mm -hmm. was talking about, that he said his superiors were a part of. Well, in March of 2013, Boris's body was found on the floor by a bodyguard in a locked bathroom with a scarf nearby and ligature marks on his neck. Oh my gosh. Post-mortem examination said that his death was consistent with hanging. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Which doesn't make sense to me at all because he was found on the floor. Let's say he was strangled with the scarf or choked himself with the scarf. Mm -hmm. Now it's on the floor next to him. I think what they're saying is that he probably hung himself from something in the bathroom, maybe like a and it fell. shower head or something, and the scarf came untied and dropped to the ground with him. Who knows what they're trying. I mean, it's definitely Putin did it. One of the things that is very suspicious is that apparently the ligature marks around his neck are like a circle instead mm. of kind of a V-shape right. on the neck, which is, would be consistent with hanging. But if it because was... a downward motion. Right. But if someone was behind him, it would be a circle. Right. I mean, yeah, he was definitely assassinated. Yeah. Well, and supposedly, uh, Boris had recently sent a letter to Putin asking for forgiveness and permission to move back to Russia. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't buy it. Yeah. The last one I'm going to cover is Boris Nemtsov. So many Borises. Yeah. Well, he was the former deputy prime minister of Russia under Boris Yeltsin, and he was a huge critic of Putin. He was found shot four times in the back, just yards from the Kremlin. Mm. Putin took personal control of the investigation into the murder, mm -mm. but the killer has never been found. God. Well, and that's what, four of probably dozens? Oh, there's hundreds of There's people. plenty more. That Putin is responsible for killing. I mean, not to mention the people that have been killed during the wars that he has started. Right. But just individual assassinations. Well, listeners, if for some reason Chance and I go missing, or if our house has a gas explosion, it's because we've been doing quite a few episodes on Putin. Yeah. And he came for us personally. Well, good job, Chance. Thank you. I was most impressed with your pronunciations. <laughs> Those are rough. <laughs> Are you ready for mine? Yes. All right. So I've kept mine pretty secret this week researching because I really did not want you to know what it was. Okay. Yes. It, it's more of a conspiracy. All right. And I know we've explained it a hundred times on here, but I'm going to do it 101. For our Patreon members in the $5 to $10 a month tiers, we release episodes called Conspiracodes, where one of us brings a conspiracy theory to the table and tries to convince the other one that it's real. Right. Then at the end, we see if we were successful in convincing them, and then we divulge whether or not we believed in it all along. Right. So I'm going to do it in that format. Cool. I love conspiracies. I know, and I should have saved this for Patreon, but I was way too excited about it, and I wanted everyone to hear it. Okay. This conspiracy is that Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, uh -huh. is a time traveler. Okay. Have you heard of this? No. Now, I've always said groaning, Matt Groening. That's what I've always thought it was. I know. Um, it's G-R-O-E-N-I-N-G, but there's a BBC article that came out, and it's like, 
10 celebrities that you're definitely pronouncing their name wrong. Oh, and he's one of them. Yeah, and he's one of them. And they said graining. So I'm going to stick with graining. If I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sorry. Well, he was born February 15th in 1954 in Portland, Oregon. And his family consisted of his older brother, Mark, his older sister, Patty, then him, then his two little sisters, Lisa and Maggie. His mother was Norwegian, a uh, Norwegian-American. I think she was born in America, but first-generation American. And her name was Margaret Wiggum. And his father was of Russian descent, and his name was Homer Groening. Oh. So the Simpsons yeah. are Marge, like Margaret, his mom, uh-huh. Homer, his dad. Right. Lisa, Maggie, and Bart. Yeah. Now, there are certain reports that have come out that said that Bart was based off of him, but he didn't want to use his own name, or his older brother, Mark. And some reports say it's a combination of the two. He just didn't want to have five kids in this comic. Uh-huh. So instead of naming him Matt or Mark, he went with Bart because it was kind of like the word brat. I gotcha. So at 23, he moved to L.A., and he found himself working a series of, like, really shitty jobs. I think he worked at a nursing home, he washed dishes, he was a chauffeur, just a bunch of odd jobs to get by. And to keep his family updated on his day-to-day life, he created a comic book called Life in Hell, where he would depict all his struggles living in L.A. Oh, I gotcha. Well, he gets this entry-level job at the Los Angeles Reader just answering phones and ends up showing his boss his Life in Hell comics that he's sending home. Uh Uh-huh. And because of that, he started getting them published in the Los Angeles Reader. Okay. He was also given a music column, but he said he rarely ever wrote about music because he didn't really know anything about it. So he would just rant and talk about random shit. And then when his boss would be like, hey, more music, he would just make up bands and give them like fake reviews. Okay. But meanwhile... The Life in Hell comic is getting super popular with readers of the Los Angeles Reader. Okay. So to capitalize on it, he and his then-girlfriend decide to write a series of comics titled Love is Hell. And then they publish that into a book. And it's basically like relationship issues made into comic strip, little yeah. comic strips. Then he goes on to create Work is Hell, School is Hell, Childhood is Hell, The Big Book of Hell, The Huge Book of Hell, and eventually Life in Hell Company. He just took a comic book that he was sending home to his family as like an update and turned it into a huge ordeal well, Yeah, where he's now publishing a bunch of books and have a bunch of series. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember as a kid wanting to like write comics and stuff because I grew up like every morning reading the comics in the newspaper. Yeah. And you loved Calvin and Hobbes, right? Yeah. Calvin and Hobbes was my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in 1985... He's approached by Fox to create a series of animated shorts for the Tracy Ullman show. Do you remember that show? No. It was like a sketch comedy show with Tracy Ullman at the head. Well, they wanted him to use his Life as Hell comics and just animate them to put in between sketches. You know how like SNL uh-huh. does the digital shorts and yeah, stuff? Yeah, it's to... like a kind of fun commercial. Or it's like or a something. time filler if you can't. Yeah, that's a better word. Well, he was afraid that if he used this Life in Hell comic strip, that he would lose all the rights for it and Fox would take it. Mm. So then he created a new comic about a quirky little dysfunctional family called The Simpsons. Yeah. And that's how The Simpsons got created. It was supposed to be just little digital shorts in between sketches on The Tracy Ullman Show. Well, it turns out The Tracy Ullman Show didn't really take off, but people fucking loved The Simpsons. <laughs> So that led to Fox spinning the sketches into a half-hour series, their very own show, The Simpsons. And in 1989, The Simpsons' full show debuted. So here's just some fun facts about The Simpsons. I never really watched the show. I think I've probably seen four full episodes. Oh, really? Total. I didn't see it growing up. Yeah, because your parents wouldn't let you watch it. No, (laughs) they wouldn't. So if I did see it... I mean, it was very few episodes. I'd, I'd seen a lot more since I'd been older and everything, but... Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hit you with Simpsons facts before I get into, like, the nitty-gritty of this conspiracy. Perfect. Just for fun. Yeah. Well, like I said, the family members in The Simpsons were named after his actual family members. And if you've ever seen the show, you know they have a grandpa uh-huh. in the show. Well, when it came time to give the grandpa a name, he felt like he had already monopolized... The naming of everything. Mm, So he just told his writing staff, you guys just think of a name. 
they ended up naming the grandpa Abraham, and that turns out that that was Matt's actual grandfather's name. Oh, <laughs> shit. When he initially sketched out The Simpsons for the Tracy Ullman show, he kind of did them really sloppily and really fast because he assumed whenever he sent it over to the animators at the show that they were going to, like, clean them up, revamp them. Use it as a rough draft or something. And they didn't. They actually traced over his crude drawings. And that's what's a rendition of it is used today. It has, it has actually cleaned up since then, uh-huh. but it's pretty similar to what he initially <laughs> drew. In fact, whenever he designed it, he thought everything was going to be in black and white. So when he did the hairstyles for The Simpsons, he just did the shapes. He wanted every character to be recognized by their profile, which is why they all have very distinct profiles. I always thought it was so weird. Yeah, it is really weird. But he just did their hair as shapes on top of their head. Yeah. Well, when they filled them in yellow, there was no defining line where their hair stopped and started on their face. Come on. So their hair just turned out to be yellow like their skin. It's like paint program. (laughs) Remember that? If you didn't have the line. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, when he saw it, he was just like, all right cool oh, weird. now marge her hairstyle was modeled after his own mother's 1960s beehive that coupled with the bride of frankenstein okay he did homer's hair with his initials in it you know the squiggle line for uh-huh. his hair is the m and then the g was his ear uh-huh it was like that originally but he said he changed it after a while because he thought it was too distracting but it it was originally mg okay He actually made their skin yellow on purpose because he felt like if someone was flipping through stations, the yellow would catch their eye and make them want to stay and watch. Uh Not only were the characters named after his family members, but you know Police Chief Wiggum. Uh Uh-huh. Wiggum is his mother's maiden name. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. And then there are also names in the show like Flanders, Lovejoy, Powell, Quimby, and Kearney. These are all streets in Portland that he grew up around. Oh, all the characters on The Simpsons have four fingers, except for God. God has five. Uh. In 2009, Marge Simpson was featured on the cover of Playboy. <laughs> That's weird. Homer's signature noise, the do, uh-huh. it's the D slash O-H, was added to the Oxford Dictionary in 2001. Really? Mm-hmm. They chose the town Springfield for The Simpsons because there are 34 different cities in America named Springfield, in 30 different states. I know of the one in Missouri. (laughs) So chances are there's a Springfield in your state. The major voice actors on the show get paid around $300,000 per episode. Damn. Yeah. There's 22 episodes a year, meaning they get $6.6 million a year. And that's just... In revenue from the voiceover work. You know, if I could get my accents down, oh. I could do some voiceover work. Um, I would love for you to do no. that. No, please. Do the Homer do. do. <laughs> oh, that wasn't bad. Thank you. Okay, now do the Marge Simpson oh homie. Oh homie. That was pretty amazing. But you know... Call me up if you need some voice work done. You can't do a British accent for shit, but you could do Marge Simpson? Hello, Gavada. Okay. <laughs> do you know Hank Azaria plays 16 different voices? Is that 16 what it is? 16 different characters? Yeah. Fuck. He has to get paid more than everyone else, right? I would think so. Uh, in the opening credits, Maggie, the baby of the family, gets scanned at the cash register, and she rings up for $847.63. And that was the average monthly cost to care for a baby back in 1989. Wow. In 1997, The Simpsons aired their 167th episode, making it the longest-running animation in TV history. And as of now, it is also the longest-running TV show in history, and they just aired their 719th episode. That is... It's crazy. Yeah. Law and Order SVU is in second with 509 <laughs> episodes. Uh, the University of California, Berkeley, offered a credited course covering The Simpsons. Wow. I don't know what you would use that for in life. Uh, How to build an empire? It's probably in the arts department. Sustainability? I don't know. And 
I hate it, but my very last fact is that Anne Hathaway